There we go. All right, we're good. So we're starting again this morning with sound for those of you watching in Psalm chapter 91, starting at verse 1. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And I love this picture, this, these attributes being attributed to God, uh, uh, whether it was David or Moses, they're, they're saying this, in the shelter of the Most High, who is above all of creation? God, the creator of all. Those who live in the shelter, that we can be in the shelter of God himself, those who are resting him, those who find themselves, put themselves under the shelter of God, who submit themselves and will find rest in the shadow of of the Almighty. And I love that we see that picture of, of, of him covering and his protection over in that shadow. Anyone who comes in underneath him, the Almighty One, the one who is able beyond all capacity to do what needs to be done. So if, if this chapter uh, 91 was a sermon, this opening verse is the Declaration of Truth. Um, oftentimes in our sermon, we do our big idea. So this is our big idea this morning. Our big idea is this. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High, those who dwell in God's presence, will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. In many ways, as I said, this song is a, a sermon. It's a prophetic word for God's people to, to re- not only to remember about God, but it's, it's, it was written to sing, to sing out and to declare and sincere praising to God, singing His truth, and, and the meaning of, of His Word is a powerful prophetic action that helps bring us and our lives and our situations into and under the authority of God. And we're going to see, as we'll go on in this, how many of you know that Moses, as he was leading God's people, uh, they faced some pretty big obstacles, and, and they had armies coming against them. And there was plagues and diseases that they, they saw in Egypt as they had to leave. We know that, that King David, he was, he was running from even his own um, people. He was running from Saul, who was trying to kill him. And later there would be enemies and armies against them. And so there was this need, this reminder that God is faithful. How I many of you know life rains on us pretty hard sometimes? You know that saying, when it, when it rains, it pours? And so it's not that we're, God keeps it from raining. It's not that God keeps it from pouring. But we're going to see his promises to protect us and to, to be with us in the midst of anything we might face. So where do we go? What do we do? Who do we call first when things aren't going right? Now, it's Mother's Day, so we'll give honor to mothers. Mothers, many of you may get the first call. Uh, my apologies to my mother. Uh, she would like to get the first call. That doesn't always happen. Try to keep your mother in the loop. But where do we go? What do we do? Who do we call first? What is our first response when life seems out of control, when situations are, as, as David or Moses, whatever perspective, answers this in verse 2, this I declare about the Lord, He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust Him. We see from from this perspective of that God is to be the first person that we call to. And this is written, Psalm was written by somebody who had gone through life whether it was Moses or David, they had experienced the weight and the trials of life, and they had leaned on counselors, they had leaned on other people giving them wisdom, they had made mistakes, big mistakes. And through all of that, they learned that when they call upon God first, they began to learn that He alone could they actually truly find refuge, a place of safety. And as the author says, He is my God I trust Him. And I love this personal declaration that we see. This response of, this is my God. And so often for us, it's easy for us to first respond to the uncertainty of a bad situation, of, of 
freaking out and, and trying to figure things out in our own mindsets and our own. And I mean, you know, we obviously it makes sense when something goes wrong, you want to find a quick solution. We don't like being uncomfortable. We, we want to figure out how to, to fix our spouse. We want to figure out how to fix our kids. We want to figure out how to fix finance, all these things in life, how to fix the world around us, our culture. And sometimes we forget that we aren't called to rush out and fix things. That perhaps we are called to first and foremost come in and under the protection of who our God and our safety is. We must first respond to the uncertainty of a bad situation with the truth and certainty of the goodness of God. This personal declaration we see here, the author is not worried about what other people might say, who or, or what other people put their trust in. They're not worried about what other people's situations or solutions might be. It's, this author is declaring who his God is, who their God is, who and where their personal hope lies. And they trust God. One of the things as we look through this, this I declare about the Lord, and I mean, you know, it's really important. I think the author is not just telling other people in this response, not just telling other people, hey, listen, you can trust God. I think this is written as much to themselves as it was anyone else. I mean, you know, we, oftentimes we need to be preaching to ourselves a lot more than we preach to anyone else. This I declare, and I imagine, and sometimes in these situations when we're, we're uncertain, how I many you know it's tough to trust God sometimes? It's trust to feel that, that it's hard to believe that everything we need is going to be in God alone, that He is going to provide, however He does it. It's easy to want to go to everything else first, try to put that in order, and then go to God and ask Him to bless that. But what we see here is this ancient wisdom of, of thousands and thousands of years of God's people following him saying, no, go to God first. Rather than trying to, to rush out and say, okay, God, come with me. Let's go attack this problem. Instead, we need to go and say, okay, God, where are you, Lord? I am getting under the wings of your protection. I'm going to sit. I'm going to rest in your presence. Lord, I'm going to let you cover me from this situation. Lord, I'm feeling banged up, bruised. I don't know what to do. God, I'm going to sit in your presence. Let you heal, restore, fill me, and then let you guide me into what needs to happen next. I believe the author is reminding themselves as much as anyone else. They're as much speaking to themselves, saying, this I declare about the Lord. Sometimes we have to do that. Look yourself in the mirror and say, no, this is God's word. This is what God says. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God. He's not someone, how many times we, it's easy to feel like, oh, the super Christians, Jesus, God's going to come through for them. But for me, oh, you know, I couldn't be possibly as good as anyone else. God's maybe if he's got time left over, he's going to take care of me. And we need to get that thinking out of our head. Who God has set free, he's set free indeed. We may have wandered. We may have been the ones to make the mess in life ourselves. But in that moment, that absolute moment that we repent and we submit ourselves to God, say, God, I need you. I'm sorry. He is there to cover us. And in that moment, he's not someone else's God. He is our God. He is my God. That personal one-on-one -on -one love and knowing of who I am and what I need. And so we are to trust this about God. And the, here's the thing about trust. Trust is a choice. Does trust just happen? Trust is a choice. Without making a choice, without choosing to trust someone, you're not trusting someone. I can say I, I 
yesterday, Silas and I got to paddle and, and we got to help one another and other people out of the canoes. And you can say you trust someone to help you out, but unless you actually take their hand and let them pull you out, you're not actually trusting them. And the same thing with God. We have to choose to trust God, which means taking steps of faith, which means there may be times where we want to do this, but God, we just know in our spirit and, and godly counsel is telling us to wait that we need to trust God and wait. And listen. And let God move on our behalf. Trust is a choice. We see that the author here chooses to trust God. Moses chose to trust God. David chose to trust God. The, the men and women of the Old Testament, they chose to trust God. God. And because he has chosen to trust God, he knows firsthand God can be trusted. So he next speaks to, to others, and, and as I said, maybe even uh, himself here, about how much we can fully trust God in verse 3 here. But that's the reality. Unless we choose to trust God, how are we ever going to know how faithful God is? And I think sometimes we, we're hesitant to fully trust God, especially if we've come out of situations and lives. And let's uh, recognize this morning, not everyone had good relationships or had healthy mothers or maybe knew who their mother. Some of us didn't have healthy fathers or parents. And so there, there can be major trust issues. How do we trust God if the people who are supposed to reflect that kind of love and care let us down? And so as a result, we know God is good. We know in our mind. And so we don't, we almost feel like that's too good to be true. And so we don't fully trust God because what if God lets me down? And then the one thing that I have hope on, I can no longer hope for. And so we unfairly never even give God a chance to love and care and protect us the way we need and the way he wants to. Verse 3. For he will rescue you from every trap. Does it say some traps? Every trap. And I, and I love this picture. It doesn't say you won't get trapped. It doesn't say the enemy. And, and there's a huge, uh, and as we go through this, this is a poetic, uh, prophetic imagery reflecting spiritual truth. As we know, there's an enemy out there. Satan lies, kills, and destroys, wanting to destroy what God has created, wanting to pull us away from God. There are traps in this world. People will set traps. The enemy spiritually will set traps. We're a little stupid. We will set traps for ourselves sometimes. It will happen. So it doesn't promise that bad things won't happen. It doesn't say that we won't fall into traps. But it says that he will rescue us when that happens. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. And what we see here in this picture, and as we know, Moses, uh, the things that God's people um, coming out of Egypt, they would have seen the plagues and they went through many things in the wilderness. David saw the horrors of, of battle and saw people fall and their enemies fall all around them. And sometimes we need to to praise and remind ourselves that God protects us from these things. But just to touch on this real quick, and uh, this particular passage has been used out of context uh, throughout this past year a little bit. And some people will say, well, this means that, that uh, there's this literal connotation that you'll never get any disease and that you'll never suffer. And we have people in this room who have suffered, gone through cancer, or still are maybe. God has been faithful and healed. 
And there's some that said, well, we don't have to worry about COVID because of this promise right here. Well, God's people still get COVID. In fact, if, if that's how this verse was intended, they wouldn't have had all the cleanliness laws where God was telling them to wash their hands and if someone was sick, to go outside and quarantine outside of God's tent. Like those are practical things that's in God's word. But it's using this, this picture, this imagery of those horrible things that they went through to, in this spiritual thing that we have, just like that, these spiritual things coming against us. There's thousands of, of demonic principalities, things coming against us, trying to destroy what God is wanting to do. And the author is revealing the spiritual truth here that in the end, as we've been looking at through, as we go through Revelation, that in the end, God wins. We are protected from these things. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. And how many of you know God does protect us? I mean, God heals. He does miraculous things. But as we'll help put this in context to get a little bit more, let's go on to verse 8 here. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. And we, we see this picture of the world around us hardened against God. And, and perhaps this would have stirred for the original audience the, the images of, of in Egypt and the Egyptians just hardened their heart, choosing, rejecting God. And as a result, just the, the natural consequences of, of the plagues and the sin around them and God protecting his people from that. Verse 11, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And I, I love, and here's where it helps us put this in context, how we can take verses and take them out of context. This is the passage that, that Satan used to try to tempt Jesus. He's like, hey, you could go up on the high part of the temple and throw yourself off. And the angels will protect you. Not even your foot will dash and be broken on the stone. And, and Jesus said, don't test the Lord your God. And so, yes, God protects us. God, he's there for us. That doesn't mean we can foolishly rush out in disobedience to God. Part of this is what it is telling us is that we remain in God's shelter underneath his wings. And how many of you know, how does a young duck or gosling stay under the protection of their mother's wings? When they're obedient to the honking. The honk, honk. We heard the mother's honking and calling, the ducks quacking. And, and how many of you have had those apparent, um, opportunities as a parent where, or experiences or your mom was, as a kid was yelling at you because you were about to get into danger? Uh, I had a tendency to like to cross the street a little sooner than my mom and we were downtown Indianapolis, and I stepped out, and I heard my mom give out this blood-curdling scream, and I stopped like this, and a car just goes, shoo, came around the corner and passed. If I had not been obedient to the call of my mother, probably would have been a bad day. <laughs> and so there's this, there's this picture of, of it's not that we can just run out and do what we want, and then God's just going to take care of everything. It's not this picture of, of we get with Jesus and everything's going to be rainbows and butterflies and cotton candy and no problems in life. No, the, pro the promise is in life's difficulties, in life's storms, when life's enemies are in the world's enemies and the spiritual enemies are coming against us, God promises to protect us and bring us through. And if we are obedient to his voice, Obedience is what keeps us under his wings. Obedience is what keeps us where we need to be, to be under the shadow of his protection. And I heard a preacher once say this, we can't ask God to bless sin. He won't do it. We can't be out doing our thing, creating a mess in our life, say, God, can you bless this? Can you, can you keep these natural consequences that I keep creating from happening? He's a loving Heavenly Father, He's not going to do that because that's just going to push us farther into destruction. And I think we see this picture of that, that mother hen. She's got her um, ducks or birds underneath. And, and sometimes it's, I can just see this picture of hail coming down from the world. And, and we want to rush out into it. And if we would just stay underneath the protection of God's wings... So we walk in obedience to him. 
for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Verse 13. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. I love that picture. And and just because it's not saying that we can't go out into the jungle and and literally crush lions and serpents under our feet, maybe you could do that. I'm guessing most of you here don't have that capacity to stomp and crush lions and, and poisonous snakes. But I want you to take this picture here. That just as vivid as that picture is, that that those spiritual things that come against us, those things that when things are going wrong in our life and you know something is trying to destroy what God has promised in your life, those spiritual lions and serpents that are trying to steal, trying to poison, trying to take away what God has promised, what God has spoken to us, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that when we rest in His presence and His Spirit, He fills us, He is with us, He puts His angels around us, and we will overcome. Those things will be crushed and defeated. We have power and authority over those things. And I love this, this imagery that we see here. Just to as powerful that picture of someone conquering a lion with their bare hands or, or taking a serpent that's against them. We have that kind of power and authority in Christ over these things. If we walk in obedience, because it's not us, it's God's Spirit working in and through us. Then this song or poem slash sermon concludes with a prophetic declaration of this. Verse 14. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. Before I go on this morning, just take a moment. Heavenly Father, as we just read this next part, Lord, there may be things in our lives going on right now. But Lord, we feel we need rescued. Lord, we feel or uh, we don't know how things are going to work out, Lord. We're struggling to trust you. Father, I pray this morning as we read this, your Holy Spirit would speak to us. That this word would come alive within us. Verse 14, the Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. God does not have a broken telephone line. When we call out to him, he hears us. If we love God, If we are trusting Him and we call out to Him, we have absolute assurance He is hearing us. And He not only hears us, He is answering us. He says, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. God will be with you in your trouble. Whether someone else has caused it, Whether we have caused it, the moment we turn to Him, the moment we repent and trust Him, He is there with us in that trouble. And He says, I will rescue and honor them. Or maybe you did something shameful and you were arrested and you were put in prison. You were in the prison of of of, of the world in the prison of brokenness and the prison of shame. And God says, in the moment you cry out to me, I'm breaking you out of that place of shame. I'm breaking you out of that place. And not only am I taking you out, I'm giving you honor. The honor that you felt was lost, all that shame I've taken away, and I'm giving you honor. We're going to celebrate you. You're going to have my name. You're going to be royalty again. 
Verse 16, I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. How many know eternal life is a long life? The life that God promises is a long life. And kids, if you're listening, there is a commandment that says, honor your father and mothers that your life may go well with you. There's some practical wisdom to that. When your mom's voice yells and you listen and obey and you stop, my life was a little bit longer because of that. When we listen and obey to the voice of God, our, not only our physical lives are preserved in an aspect, but our spiritual lives will go on into eternity. And I love that God says, I will make all things new. That It's not that we're escaping the physical and going into the spiritual, but the whole point is God's kingdom come, God's kingdom here, the, the physical and the spiritual together as it should be in that picture of Garden of Eden where, where God's presence walked in the fullness and the goodness. And he says, I will make all things new. And however he does that, whatever it looks like, we have the promise that if we stay with God, with him, we will be in that with him. The Holy Spirit ever in and with us, leading, correcting, empowering, and preserving us against the spiritual lions and serpents that would try to destroy us. So this morning I just say, let us accept, remember, and declare God's promises this morning. These promises we see in His Word. Let us, like the author, let us remind ourselves. Let us sing these songs to ourselves. And um, did a sermon a couple years back called Praise It Out. When we find ourselves in, in moments of, of struggle and find ourselves and we don't know what to do, remind yourselves, sing these hymns, sing these songs that God puts on our heart, sing them and declare His truth. We remind ourselves over and over again, God knows how great He is. We're the ones that forget. That's why we sing. And as we sing and as we remind ourselves, what that does is we begin to say yes and we begin to accept and we begin to, to take hold of who God is and all that He's promised us. And we begin to come in under the, the covering of His wings. We begin to, and that's why God's presence inhabits the praises of His people. We're not drawing God to us. We are allowing God to draw us to Him. So let us accept, remember, and declare God's promises. Let us often sing and praise God for his faithfulness. Let us remain in Jesus and walk in obedience to him and rely not upon ourselves, but upon the power and work of the Holy Spirit within us. The promises of his word, so that we may remain under the shadow and protection of God's wings, those maternal wings of God, that we may be protected and covered and stay with Him where we need to be.